The following interview was conducted with Professor Robert E. Santini, Professor Emeritus in Chemistry for the Pre-University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, September 29, 2011 in Stewart Center, SWAM Instruction Room. This is part two of the interview. Good mm -hmm. afternoon, Professor Santini. Uh, you would talk about the lectureships? Um, in terms of the invited lectureships, um, without a doubt, the um, series that, that I'll always remember had to do with nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. Um, there was a radical change in the way NMR was done starting around 1970. Uh, in 1967, uh, Professor Richard Ernst at the ETH in Zurich published a paper. Uh, uh, the paper was by Ernst and Anderson. Um, Ernst was at the time working at a commercial firm, Avarian Associates, and Anderson was his manager there. Um, I knew both people. Uh, and they published a, a method of obtaining high resolution NMR by pulsing the experiment with high power RF pulses and taking Fourier transforms, taking the data in time domain, in other words, taking time-dependent data and doing Fourier transforms. Uh, it was known by physicists that this technique would work. And uh, the problem at the time was that uh, the taking the data and doing the Fourier transform was regarded as a sort of a mainframe computer exercise. And Ernst and Anderson managed to do this on a small computer, relatively small computer, and there are a whole host of reasons why they were able to do that then. Um, Varian, as a company, um, was slow to see the implications of that, and Ernst, uh, for his own reasons, went back to Switzerland, went back to his academic career. And uh, various people in the NMR community began to see the possibilities. Among them, some people here at Purdue, and I work with a fellow named John Grutzner, who was hired uh, at Purdue in 1969, if I remember. And he wanted to do this experiment, and he wanted to do it for practical reasons. And uh, my job was to basically understand the experiment and actually build equipment that could do this. Um, we. I read the paper, and I think I understood it pretty quickly, and uh, began to work on that sort of an experiment, and we were among the first people in the world uh, to be able to do that experiment independently. At the time, I don't think there were more than two or three labs, and we were all working more or less in parallel, and we all did the experiment almost simultaneously. Uh, there was a fellow at Indiana University named Adam Allerhand uh, who did the experiment probably a little before we did and did it very well. And he began to look at biological molecules and uh, at the time he was able to see individual carbon atoms in large molecules and that started the whole area of being able to go eventually and look at proteins. And uh, we looked at small molecules and medium-sized molecules. Eventually, somebody came here named uh, John Markley, and we got into the large molecule business ourselves. And um, uh, we were very open about how we did these experiments. As a result, I had invitation after invitation to go other schools, to other schools and talk about the method, talk about how it was done, um, how we were able to make it happen. Uh, many people tried to do this experiment, and I think they underestimated how careful you had to be to make it happen. Um, it, today, it seems relatively simple, uh, especially when you can buy commercial equipment that can do it much better than we ever did it at the time. <laughs> Uh, but that's what happens after a generation time, or so. Sure. Uh, to do it the first time is very hard. And um, uh, I had a whole series of requests to go places. I probably had job offers every time I turned around. And I, for reasons of my own, I tended to stay at Purdue. In fact, I spent my whole career here. Mm -hmm. But those are the series of lectures I okay. really remember. Okay. Uh, and uh, I ended up establishing a lecture series that uh, we taught. We actually taught summer courses in this As uh, here at Purdue. Yeah. Okay. And we did a two-week short course here at Purdue for many years, uh, and we began to educate people on the methods, on NMR in general, on carbon-13 NMR, on Fourier transform NMR. Uh, we actually gave that course a couple of times at commercial firms. At uh, one point, IBM 
hired us to go there and give it to their people. It was quite interesting to go to a commercial firm uh, and and have have them bring 50 people in and we gave the course. Varying associates of a company that made NMR equipment eventually had me giving that course uh, to their own customers as they introduced uh, better and better FT equipment. And that went on for probably 20, 25 years. Mm-hmm. And in time, the whole world caught up, and I think we probably there was no need to do that. But that that was was the Very invited uh, program that I remember most most clearly, and it certainly was uh, with warm feelings. I feel like uh, we educated a generation of scientists. Right came from the bottom, went up. Yeah, and uh, we told them what we knew how to do, and I think many people learned. They went off and then did it. I now have graduate students, uh, watch graduate students uh, using NMR, and they, from their point of view, it's always been there. (laughs) Uh, And that's that's a reward of sorts. It is, that's right. uh, When they have no idea where it came from. Uh, You know you've done something useful. That's right. How about department heads? Who was the department head when you came? When I came to Purdue, uh, Earl McBee was the department okay. head, and he had been the department head for a long time, uh, probably sometime in the 50s. And he remained the department head through a fair portion of my graduate career. Um, he eventually stepped down, uh, not willingly, I am, am pretty sure. Uh, well, I know that for a fact. Uh, there was uh, some dust up about the way he was running the department, and eventually the faculty kind of revolted, and uh, Joseph Foster became the department head, and then it became a rotating department head, uh, and they basically served five-year terms, and uh, after Joe Foster, I believe uh, Dale Marjoram was the next department head. Now, Dale I knew very well. Um, uh, among the formative influences in my life, Dale Marjoram was one of them. Uh, my uh, PI, I uh, and research director was Harry Pardue, and Harry Pardue and Dale Marjoram were close friends, and they were close scientific collaborators. And I was in the Pardue group, but there was a, almost no division between the Pardue group and, and the Marjoram group. Harry Pardue developed scientific instrumentation, and I was very happy to be in his group because that's what I like to do. Sure. And, uh, and Marjoram's group concentrated on interesting solution chemistry, and that was sort of a match made in heaven. And uh, the groups were located next to one another. And uh, the, the labs were the next to The labs were, and there was an internal uh, entrance between the labs, and the group meetings quite often were joint group meetings. And uh, basically, you almost had two principal investigators to guide you. And, uh, and uh, frankly, uh, I would present information on uh, various aspects of modern chemical instrumentation and Dale and his group would question why they were the way they were and uh, I remember vividly one uh, one uh, session when we were talking about signal to noise why just better devices didn't get you better signal and better limits of detection and I started trying to explain what is known as information theory why there were thermodynamic limits on experiments, why that there, the inherent noise in an experiment is related to what is called entropy functions, uh, which in chemistry are related to disorder. And uh, I, I really was having difficulty convincing Dale's group, not so much Dale, but his group, that there were fundamental limits to what you could get in signal to noise, that you could trade off some things like bandwidth uh, to get signal, uh, basically time, uh, observation time to get signal. And, uh, and that there were limits and that you had to trade these things off against one another. And, and I finally had to put down equations and, and, and so on. And uh, they sort of got it, but they didn't get it. And I decided I had to understand this more myself to be able to explain it to other people. And that set the tone for probably the rest of my career. That one discussion, one evening, it was an evening discussion uh, <laughs> because we had the group meeting starting at 7 in the evening. And uh, so Dale's group's input and questioning about things, always with the chemistry in mind, kind of kept Harry's group oriented toward understanding 
what we were doing, understanding what the limitations are. On the other hand, uh, Harry could provide Dale with, uh, with advanced techniques and technology, and that we did, especially when it came to doing high-speed chemical experiments. And it went from being able to do something called a stop-flow experiment, where we could resolve chemical reactions on the millisecond time scale, to something called a temperature jump or pressure jump experiment, where we eventually resolved experiments occurring on the microsecond time scale and below. And uh, Dale was a kinetics guy. In other words, he was interested in reaction kinetics, how fast they occurred, mm -hmm. whether they were first-order reactions or more complicated reactions, and, and so on. I, I think if I made a fundamental contribution to solution chemistry, it came out of that mm -hmm. period where I developed a technique where we used dispersed spectra across what we call array detectors. It dispersed the spectra across what was then a TV camera tube, and we could watch the entire spectrum of reaction as it occurred in real time. And that came right out of a discussion in one of those joint group meetings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I happened to break my leg, and I was sitting in the hospital thinking about how to solve this problem. And I was reading a magazine about television cameras, just an article about how TV cameras work, and it came to me that I could take the sensor in a TV camera strip away the optics and, and use it in a different way. Uh, nobody believed me at the time, and we actually put, uh, one of uh, Pardue's students and I put that thing together with about $100 worth of parts. Uh, Harry was out of town, and we just did it. And he came back, and we actually had something running, and he just flipped out. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> and uh, so was Pardue nice. and Marjoram were, uh, were really influences in a very constructive way. It was a, just an ideal place for a grad student mm -hmm. to be. Good. Marjoram was head of the department, and he was both a scientist and a good administrator. And I think the department was very well off for him. Eventually, Harry Pardue was head of the department mm -hmm. also. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think uh, whether Harry succeeded Dale. Uh, I believe he did. I think it was yeah. immediately afterwards. And Harry, uh, I think, tried very hard to make the department perfect. And uh, the result is he, he the, being head of the department, consumed him. And uh, and he only served four years as department head. I think it was much more stressful for him than it was for Dale. Um, then he went back, and he had allowed his group to sort of go their own way. He'd drawn it down to just a very few students, and he just started writing proposals. He restarted his group meet again. By then, I was in the AMU facility, and eventually about the time John retired, I was taking over, and I watched Harry rebuild his group. I worked with some of Harry's students mm -hmm. uh, at that time, worked just to help Harry get going again, and he came back as a full-scale yeah. practicing scientist. Um, I think he was very, con Harry was very conscientious about everything he did, and I think he was very conscientious about working with grad students. He was conscientious that his science should be correct and repeatable, uh, and he was conscientious about being a first-rate department head. And, uh, and I just, I mean, I can't say yeah, anything that's good. more that's than, good. I mean, I'm trying to be very complimentary. Yeah. Dale and, and Harry were very were different, together. but they worked together, and I think for that period of nine or ten years that they were each both in succession department heads, the department really did very well, thrived. Sure, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, Talking about some of the, um, I think you talked a little bit about AMU because we talked about the facility and how it yeah. came about. Was there, if there's anything you wanted to add? And then I thought you'd make some comments on Dr. Brown and Degushi. Well, Herb Brown, I probably got to know Herb Brown a little bit when I was first uh, first year grad student because I had an opportunity to work for Brown. I came in believing I would be a synthetic inorganic chemist. I liked inorganic chemistry. I liked the synthetic work. Uh, it was a little different from organic chemistry, and then the, a lot of the inorganic compounds are air reactive, and you would work in vacuum systems. And so it took a little bit of more of a hands-on approach to do it. You didn't just boil things up in pots. And uh, always the hands-on work has appealed to me. And among the inorganic chemists in the department, there were two people that, uh, that really appealed to the way I wanted to work. One was Grant Urey, and the other was 
Herb Brown. I ended up working for Grant Urey for a couple of years, and uh, if I think it over, I probably should have worked for Herb Brown. But uh, Urey was a fascinating character, charismatic would be the word. He and Herb Brown came out of the same graduate group at the University of Chicago, and uh, Urey had a smaller group, and it looked like it would be a little more personal relationship, and that it was, but in working for Grant, I discovered that I really had the knack for the electronic side of things. He got interested in electron paramagnetic resonance, and I ended up assembling and building and tweaking EPR equipment for him. And in the process, I discovered that I was doing a lot of other people's work, but I wasn't getting my own done. <laughs> and, uh, and I probably uh, decided there that, that if I was doing what I enjoyed doing, I probably ought to be doing it in the area I enjoyed it. And Grant decided to go to another school. He uh, had a chance to be the head of the department at Tufts in Boston. And I made the decision I would rather have a Purdue degree and stayed with a state at Purdue. And that gave me an opportunity to make a choice. And again, I weighed the decision of Herb Brown versus anybody else. And I decided that Harry Pardue, based on some coursework I'd taken and mm -hmm. knowing some of his students, was really where I wanted to be. And I went to Harry, and he said he would have me in his group, and so, uh, so I joined yeah. his group. Uh, at the time, it was unusual for people to switch majors like that, but I did it, and things it worked, worked out. out. Right. Now it's not so uh, uncommon, and people do uh, discover that they would rather do something different than they started, and the department doesn't have so much trouble with it, but I was probably a real pioneer in those days. Um, I don't regret it for a minute. Uh, my right. wife <laughs> says that I made two great decisions in life. One was marrying her, and the other was going to work for Harry <laughs> Pardue. Okay. Uh, um. the, now, getting back to Herb, um, I had friends in Herb's group, and I always sort of hung out with Herb's group, hung out with those people, and knew what work was going on. And when it came to NMR-type experiments, that sort of thing, I was always a bit of a consultant down there. When I finished my degree and joined the Amy facility, I began to work in NMR support, as I mentioned, bringing up the NMR capabilities in the department. And I had been a NMR person doing NMR survey work. I had done a lot of work with Herb students through that. Uh, he began to ask me about running NMR experiments, particularly running boron-11 experiments. Um, I began to advise him on how to do this, and this just led naturally into sure. specifying instrumentation. And at the time, you just couldn't buy it. In fact, you still can't. And so we had to specify equipment to some of our own design and merge the two. And I got his first B11 experiments run that way. And he was delighted to be able to do that. And uh, this just led to a natural collaboration. And I, in observing Herb as a PhD myself, I discovered he was simply the best research manager I have ever seen, aside from being a great chemist. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that are great chemists, but there are fewer that are great chemists that can also manage themselves and manage other people. Mm -hmm. Herb was just, I mean, unbelievably good chemist. He had terrific insight into how reactions would run, an encyclopedic knowledge of the chemical literature. Uh, and this ability to sit with people, understand what you knew, and integrate it into his program, and do that in a humane way. There are some very smart people that um, can create a shock wave around them that they get done what they want, but they can damage a lot of other people doing it. And Herb was not like this. Herb could develop people. He could bring out their talents and sort of create the best problem-solving scientists. I never saw him uh, be abusive to anybody. Uh, he would take people, he would bring out their talents, he would work with them. And uh, he could get people working and be supportive of them and know what was going on in the group all the time. And he would have a dozen projects going, and they all would relate to whatever his goal happened to be that year or whatever. 
and uh, he would keep that straight in his head. And everybody had access to her. I mean, you just didn't walk in. He had a regular schedule. And if you had something important, you could make an appointment and see him in a timely way. But he always managed to keep straight whatever he was doing with you. And, and he would sit with you, and he had this little onion skin method, he, he called it. He worked with this one kind of paper and a pen, and he would always make notes. And he had you the notes. And when you came back, you'd look at the notes, and you'd decide what you had gotten done and what you hadn't gotten done. And it just was an effective way to work with people. And he was just a nice guy. I mean, uh, he could be all business, and then he could shift and be personal. But, uh, but he could motivate people. And he certainly did that to me. Right. I, all good qualities I, that I, resonated. Yeah. I certainly felt like he could get the best out of me. And I would go to work uh, for him. And uh, on NMR, he knew next to nothing. And I realized he was relying on my judgment. And I would lay out things for him, and we would make notes. And I'm certain that he would ask some other expert, somebody he knew about NMR. And often I could tell when I met with him again who he had asked because I could, I was knowledgeable about the NMR community. And Multi, it's called second opinion. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I could tell from the opinion who he would ask. And I would say, oh, you were talking to this person or that person and because I can tell from the advice you're getting. Uh, I understand what their opinion was. I said, well, you, and, and sometimes I would say I'd have to disagree with them, and if, if you ask the question this way, that's why you got that opinion. And I sort of developed uh, a working relationships where he would listen to what I had to say. And I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of his money on stuff, on NMR spectrometers and eventually infrared equipment and so on. And uh, he... And it all worked. He was very happy with the results. And uh, so that was my interaction with him. Mm -hmm. But I also watched him take that equipment and adapt his chemistry. I mentioned in my earlier interview that NMR is a quadrupolar nucleus, that it gives good NMR spectra only if it's in the right chemical environment. And he, he got that message very early. And so he adjusted the chemistry to make the NMR spectra work. He got his group to understand how to get good spectra from the spin one-half nuclei, where this wasn't a factor. Uh, he also used the boron spectra as a fingerprint for structure in ways that nobody else was using, and he just began to use B11 to solve problems that would have taken a long time to solve by any other method. And it became a probe for him that other boron people are just going to, well, they do use it. Um, sure. And uh, I'm thinking particularly of a guy named George Ola, who also won a Nobel Prize, began to use some of Brown's techniques. Uh, and her, in effect, became a pioneer in certain NMR methods just because he was pushing the yeah. chemistry. Although there are people that would never have expected that of him. I might say that Herb also was uh, helped the department in another way. We had a time when uh, computers were creeping into chemistry, and uh, we had a gentleman named Sam Peroni in the department who started using computers to do high-speed data acquisition. And there was actually a little pushback from some of the faculty that this might not really be chemistry. I remember an open coffee hour where faculty and grad students attended where this blew up into a discussion, if not a debate. And Herb just said one day, I have no idea whether computers are going to be useful in chemistry or not, but uh, the only way we're going to find out is let somebody explore the issue, and that seems to be what Sam is doing, so uh, why don't we shut up and let him do it? And that was the end of it. And that probably is one of the reasons the analytical division really grows to the position it's in today. And uh, that discussion stopped after Herb just said that publicly. And uh, this is well before his Nobel Prize or anything, but you know, it just was, his attitude always was explore the issue, see if you can get chemical results, and let the results speak for themselves. Right. Okay. Uh, Nagishi. Just a couple comments. That, uh, um, uh, Nagishi was a quiet kind of guy. He kept doing his work. Uh, I'll have to tell you that I think 
a lot of people felt that Nagishi's work falls into the general area of what's called organometallic chemistry. The earliest example of this is so-called Grignard reactions, and they're named after Victor Grignard, who won a Nobel Prize in the, uh, about the end of World War I, uh, around 1918, 1919. Uh, and it's a class of reactions that involve a metal as an intermediate, but the metal eventually comes out of the reaction, and so it's sort of a catalytic thing. And there have been a whole series of organometallic reactions like the Nagishi reactions. And uh, I think H was trying to do the Grignard type reactions that they're much gentler conditions. I mean, he says that now, and I think he was always, that's been the goal. But I think people sort of sold his reaction short. And this, I'm certain that people were saying, well, Nagishi's just following a well-trodden path. And his reactions are based on other metals, mostly, well, other metals. Uh, and we'll leave it at that, uh, other transition metals. And he found much gentler conditions to do these type of reactions, and he elucidated the mechanism, the reactions, and so on. And they became very widely adopted for uh, industrial purposes and the rest of it. And one aspect of the, of the academic community is, is when things developed wide industrial applications, people tend to look down on them. That's not somehow uh, respectable to have wide practical applications. And I think people for years thought Nagishi had no chance at a Nobel Prize and he was just a practical chemist. And in fact, he'd gone into the five-year retirement plan with Purdue and was giving up his labs and everything else. Now, Herb Brown always supported Nagishi. I know he wrote letters and in support of him for many things uh, because I saw him signing them once or twice. And so uh, Herb always felt that Nagishi was a very creative chemist and had done some significant stuff. But I think oh, I heard people say, well, Nagishi's just following yeah. this organometallic anyway, route. And, uh, and uh, finally, the world did note Nagishi. Right. I kind of have to smile at that because uh, Nagishi never lost hope. Uh, I saw him the day before the Nobel Prize was awarded, and uh, he was sort of hopping around. I mean, you could tell he was a little nervous. Uh, Did he think something was in the wind? I kind of wonder about that. Uh, I actually asked him, I passed him as, as he was coming in from the parking garage, and he was kind of jumping around on his, the balls of his feet, and I said, are you nervous because it's Nobel week? And, and he, he denied that. Uh, but and he said, "Oh, you know, the chances are one in ten, one in fifty, or so on." But he was jumping around like he really was nervous. And to this day, I I have half I half believe that somebody may have told him he was more in the running than we know, because he was just jumping around. Yeah, he was, uh, but but H was always a very quiet guy, always kept working always had confidence in what he was doing. Uh, his group was always a lot smaller than Herb's. Uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, Herb was sort of painted a big canvas, was very loud at seminars. You had to be careful. If you got the, if you got the chalk away from you, you'd never get a word in edgewise. <laughs> Nagishi was the other way around, very quiet. Very different. They got along very well, though. Sure. And, uh, and uh, there were people that just there were people that, that told me that Herb would never get a Nobel Prize because a fellow named Lipscomb got the so-called Boron Prize. There were people who told me that uh, Nagishi had no chance, and then they had their reasons were, as I mentioned, uh, and I have to laugh at all yeah. of that. Um, awards and honors. Talk, I want you to make a comment on the the two technology commercialization awards that you received from um, the university. The, the, Very nice. It's nice to have them. It is. I would say that it was harder to get those patents than it was to do the discoveries. Um, Others have shared similar remarks. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know whether the Purdue made it harder or the patent office made it harder. But All the pieces that go in with that make it hard. Right. One of them was in NMR, and one of them is in a form of chromatography, a separations technique that's completely outside of my area. I just began to collaborate with a guy down at IUPY, and he had the germ of an idea that he'd been working on for 20 years. And 
I basically said, well, look, the way you want to do this isn't going to work. The, you know, that I've done lots of work with instrumentation separations that you're going to have to try. High voltage is part of it. And so I outlined how to do it with high voltage. High pressure is part of it. I outlined how to make the pressure uniform. And pretty soon, we're both the inventors. And uh, the NMR part was pretty easy to do. The, the PPEC, the, the uh, polar chromatography part, was much more difficult to do. But we got them all both working in relatively straightforward fashion. When it got to doing the, the, um, the discovery part, the, uh, the disclosure part with the university, it became harder because we started having to write things out and then the lawyers got involved. And uh, the lawyers look at this in a completely different way. They want to try to patent everything, you know. And uh, then it seemed like we spent more time with the lawyers than we did in the lab. You don't often think we think that's true, but right. I right, hear it is. And well, they both got patented, right. and then right. then the and the they're the experts from that angle of the patent process. Then the university wanted to commercialize, and then a whole different type of lawyer got involved, where they're wanting startup companies. They want us to start up startup companies, which we did in one case, and uh, and then they want you to generate intellectual property that they can turn around and sell and market and so on. And what happens is it takes over your life. Now, there are some people that are born entrepreneurs, and this is what they want to do. Um, to me, the, there's a difference in the academic world versus the entrepreneurial world. In the ad academic world, you try to learn something, and then at some point in the research literature, you lay your cards on the table. You have to tell the world what you did and how you did it. The, the basic instruction in a learned journal is that you have to tell enough that another expert in the field can reproduce the results. In a startup company, that's the last thing they want you to do. They want you to do something and keep it all a secret. And they want every aspect of this secret to be covered in a, in a way that, that every little bit of it is a, a secret in and of itself, a separate little patent. And, and hopefully it's worth money. And so you completely change your point of view, your outlook, the way you operate. And I'm not built, or at least I'm not conditioned after an entire adult life of disclosure to go to non-disclosure. And I just had a lot of difficulty yeah, with the startup right, company. Yeah. Uh, the, on the other hand, the startup company exists. It's actually making something that sells it. Uh, I, if you want to make something that's truly useful, that people can buy, then you have to go through the process. But my role in something like that is to be a scientific officer, not a business sure, person. Right, yeah. Does that answer the question yeah, in some does. way? And you also got the outstanding alumnus for the Department of Chemistry. Um, a couple years ago. I was stunned when I was nominated for that. Uh, it turns out that people from my generation of grad students became aware of my role in the Amy facility, and and even people afterwards that I had worked with when they were grad students themselves had nominated me. Apparently, I had had a real impact on grad students as, as large, apparently, as some of their own major professors. And it was really kind of humbling. Uh, I kind of treasure that. It's, uh, it's, it's just... Very nice. It's very nice. Very it's, nice. Uh, it's one of those things that you get it and you smile and you say, well, maybe it was all worthwhile. <laughs> and I think that customer service award from the College of Science, that's very nice. Well, it's the same thing. Yeah, it turns out wonderful. that there were people in the dean's office that were aware of some of the things I had done. But it's nice to be yeah. acknowledged, you know, and it, it gives you a fuzzy feeling. Yeah, it does. Because there are many people who don't have that. Right. Um, it was nice to, 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 to have somebody say, you've been doing a good job over the years. I think when I see that, when you see customer service, you think you're dealing with, it's sort of a different thing, yeah. a teacher-student kind of thing. You get the teaching award for the customers. I mean, I, I'm aware of the award, so I know what yeah. it represents, and I think it's very nice. Well, this was primarily sure. interaction with grad students, right, and exactly. um, uh, that's 
if, if I've had in motivation uh, my whole career, and John Amy gave this to me, it's that if you're going to do the job that you're do that you're taken undertaken to do in that instrument facility, you're going to work with grad students and you're going to help them through. And just think about all the challenges you had in getting through yourself. Right. Uh, that one of your reasons for being here is to do that. And right. uh, and and the further I got, the more that that lesson came home to me. All right. Now you're retired, and what what's your retirement? What are you doing at the present time? At the present time, you're going to laugh. Um, I, I go into, um, I, I particularly like the work that one faculty person, Scott McClucky, is doing in our department. I think he does it. You're still affiliated with the facility? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I, um, I'm a visiting scholar in the department now. And uh, I really like the work that Scott McClucky is doing. Um, he is an instrument builder. He superbly trains his students to be mass spectroscopists. And I've always been interested in mass spectroscopy, and I've never had a chance to really learn it from the ground up. So I go in, I am a visiting scholar. I spend my time in his group, about half time, work with his grad students. Good. And we're building a couple of instruments at the moment, and I'm working with a postdoc and a couple of grad students. I'm probably doing exactly what I've always been doing, except I don't have any administrative things to worry about. And uh, what I did before I came over this afternoon is uh, I was sitting working with a student. We're applying Fourier transform methods to a new form of mass spectroscopy. Just like back in 1970, that's wonderful. and uh, the, it's all worth it, right? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm fighting exactly the same problems. We're <laughs> we're trying to get enough signal to noise to be able to see uh, to see trapped ions. Uh, we have to get rid of uh, spurious systematic signals. Uh, it just it's like reliving this whole experience all over again. And I'm working with a student that has never ever played with with these techniques and uh, even though he's a postdoc he's aware that they exist he knows that they've been used in various forms of uh, of instrumentation and for him this is a whole new area for me it's amazing how i am going through the same experience but in a completely new area and that what i've learned is being applied again and i'm going through the same learning curve of learning how to do something I've never done before, but encountering some of the same problems I encountered at the very start of my academic career. And you would think this would be old hat, but it's not. Uh, and uh, we went through, over the past month or six weeks, this business of not seeing, the best signal we could see was a little bump on the noise where we could turn the ion source off and it went away, and we turned the ion source on and it came back. Well, that is, the, that is the first big break when you can turn something on and see this blip and know that, well, there's a signal there. And bit by bit, that signal went first to two or three to one signal to noise, then five or ten to one. No, it's probably 75 to 100 to one as of this afternoon. And we're beginning to decide how to use it practically. We can probably get it a lot better, but it's good enough now to do applied experiments. And when I came over here, I had to stop and say, I got to come over for this interview, but we'll pick up where we left off. Now, what's the first serious applied experiment we can do to show it can do something useful? And that is a kind of a thrill and an exploration. I have a hard time getting non-scientists or my wife, who is in agronomy, to appreciate that seeing this stuff for the first time is like walking around a mountain or over the top of a hill and seeing something you never knew was there. It's like going west with Lewis and Clark or something. I understand, I understand exactly what you're saying. I, uh, you convey it very well. You just And I get the same experience. You know, I can see your feelings. It's great. Yeah, I mean, it's just you're seeing something that no one ever saw before. That's right, exactly. And you're going to show it to them. And some fraction of those people are going to go out and do it, and they're going to make it better. And in five years or three years or something, you're going to be stunned at what people will do with it. Right. I mean, you can tell it's going to be useful, sure. and it's going to be useful in ways you won't appreciate. There you go. Right. Yeah. That's what's in it for me, and so that's what I'm still doing. Good. Anything that I forgot to ask, or anything in closing um, that you want to say? Well, 
uh, what do I want to say? Uh, I'm a little concerned about the stresses that the research and academic community are under these days. Um, I'm one of the sort of Sputnik generation. When I was in high school, the Russians launched their satellite and suddenly uh, American society was interested in education and turning out scientists and engineers and so on. And I probably lived off of that with the results of what people did in response to that right through my graduate career and probably well into, uh, oh, I don't know, almost the 1990s. Uh, the Cold War ended and we seemed to have lost our direction. Um, one hopes we find it. And uh, I have concerns uh, as to where we go from here. Um, Purdue is a terrific school. Uh, it's a terrific, there are some tremendous capabilities here. I could talk about where I think the faults are in the university, and there are a few. Um, but it's in the sciences, we are beginning to work with very old and decrepit equipment and old and decrepit labs. And there's a point where you cut the funding and uh, you cut it and you cut it and the capability goes away forever. And uh, the older generation is retiring and uh, it's not clear to me that, uh, that the next generation of scientists is gonna get as good an education or as good a background. Uh, we, uh, we have many more foreign students on the campus and they're good students. But the thing that's different now than it was maybe 20, 25 years ago is those folks are not gonna stay in this country. They're gonna go back. Mm -hmm. And uh, the American scientific establishment and the American research establishment are definitely on a downward curve. And uh, there, it's not, there's not one reason for it. There are many there are reasons. Factors. They come into play there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the only thing I can compare it to is uh, if I listen to people talk, older people talk about the 1930s, uh, it seems like the American establishment in science and education was on a downward path then, and the only thing that stopped it was World War II. Uh, well, I don't hope for a world war. I hope that something does reverse yeah. that trend. Right. And I don't know if other people have said this to you yeah. or said that into yeah, the machine, yeah. but just a difficult, very difficult time. Yeah. yeah. It, this is, the, I would have to tell you that, that I have never seen a worse time since I graduated from high school. The only thing I can compare it to is what, what I have had people tell me about the Depression years from 1930 to 1940, mm -hmm. when it was very hard to do anything. And, uh, and I would ha hate to think of that as being a trend. Mm -hmm. That's okay. about it. Good. Thank you, President mm -hmm. Santini. I appreciate that.